All right, so I'm talking to Encore Energy with Mr. Paul Gordonson here. That's a, I guess, a company and an executive who need no introduction. Uh, but before we get into some of the questions here, I'd like you to know that uh, I'm an inexperienced and uneducated 26-year-old kid, basically, and I have no idea what I'm talking about. So this is going to be a conversation that's general and impersonal in nature. It's going to contain some forward-looking statements, and it's going to contain no investment advice whatsoever. So, and before taking any investment decisions, you might want to do, actually, you might want to do three steps, which would be contact a professional financial advisor, then do your own thinking and research, and then also go to cdar.com where you can see all the official documents for Encore Energy. That all said, Mr. Gordonson, thank you for investing your time in me, sir. Well, thanks for having me back. I appreciate it. Thanks. Absolutely. Yeah, it's the, the, the pleasure is all mine. I think you're one of the, the one of the most knowledgeable people on this sector. So I'm looking forward to this discussion. And you know, it's been a while since we last spoke. Maybe you'll maybe about a year or not a year, like it's 11 about months. A year. Yeah, something right, like last summer. Here. Yeah. How are things over there? It's good. It's been very busy since we last talked. Obviously, we've uh, I've actually moved. I was last time we talked, I was living in Colorado, I moved back to Texas where I grew up. And uh, to be closer to our operations, we moved our head office to uh, Texas from Vancouver. And uh, that allows us to be able to manage with, uh, our activities and that are out in the field right now. We're and uh, we're drilling and we're putting in well fields right now. We've just bought, we finished up our capital campaign on our Rosita plant. So it's been good to be close by, but it means I spent quite a bit of time out in the field just to stay in touch with the, the, what's going on and, and uh, with the management team. Hmm. So big things are happening as well. Uh, you just signed a contract. Maybe we can talk about that. Uh, like, and, and I, I, I guess just a more of a straightforward question. I just want to know how that, really happened because it like the news release said that they came and visit you and like did they immediately want to sign a contract and maybe just in general talk to me how the how the negotiations are, are going right now like do, do, do you feel like you had the upper hand and are we in a buyer's market or in a seller's market how does that how's the feeling in the market well first of all it did come out of a site visit uh you know we always welcome uh, even utilities we don't do uh direct business with come out and see what we're doing we want to establish that we're a, 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 an operating company. We're going into production that uh, everything we say we're, we're doing that we're actually doing. And that's really important to, to provide that credibility. So we, we open our doors to fuel buyers, just like we do for investors and others uh, to, to come out and see what we're doing. And uh, it led to, you know, we had a, I mean, there wasn't an instantaneous, oh, let's do a deal right away. It was one of those things uh you know, uh, the, the, the person who was there, we went back to his management and said that this could be an opportunity, uh, a real producer, and uh, it gives us, some, you know, provides us a secured, you know, uh, supply, uh, opportunity for supply. Uh, and this, I'll be honest with you, the conversation happened before February 24th, started happening at that point. And February 24th is obviously the day that uh, the Ukraine, uh, the invasion of Ukraine occurred started mm -hmm. and uh, and as a result uh, it was it wasn't really done in a buyer's market seller's market approach it was more what works we want to do business with you what do you need from us and then basically it was a bit of a back and forth with terms and and everything else and uh, links and quantities and all that back and forth because you know there, there was uh, you know we have to look we have to balance what they're asking for relative to what we can deliver we believe we can deliver without uh, capping our our, uh, uh, our our production on the out years so it uh, it was a bit of a balance and, and back and forth and uh, I, I would say it was a very it was a great conversation and great uh, you know I, I felt very good you know several phone calls and. Uh, uh, at least one face-to-face -face meeting uh, when we had an opportunity to get together, and uh, it was very productive. And that's generally how most of them work. Uh, you know, in the past we had uh, RFP request for proposals. You respond to that. It's kind of a blind proposal that you're giving them. You don't know what you're competing against, uh, and that's worked out for us. We have a, that was our first utility contract was through an RFP. This was more of an off-market type of discussion. And I see that the industry, the utilities are trending towards the off-market uh, discussions rather than doing the blanket RFPs because the number of players that are now that they want to go to 
are focused in the West, less than, and less focus on Central Asia and Russia. Uh, and so that means they, they don't, putting out a blanket RFP uh, may or may not get the results they're looking for. So I see that uh, that's why knowing and having good relationships with these field buyers and the companies, the utilities themselves, uh, which is something I've strongly done for the last you know, 20 years, uh, provides that opportunity to have those basically honest and open conversations. And I, I'd say that uh, the market shifted to where, you know, in the past, I would have to ask for time and to speak to a utility uh, about our, any potential opportunities. But in this case with Encore, it's now where they're calling me and wanting to have a conversation. And so it's, it's transitioned. I would say the catalyst, obviously, was the Russian invasion and the, the, the real uh, supply risk that's occurring, that's actually manifesting itself more and more every day uh, as a result of Russia's invasion of Ukraine and then all the supply constraints that are being created strictly by the fact that uh, even from uh, countries like Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan need to get find alternate routes because Russia is not an option any longer. So it's created, it's created opportunities for Western suppliers and uh, I'd say the story's not done yet. I, I expect more to, to occur over a period of time. That's generally the sense of where things are. I wouldn't call it necessarily a buyer or seller's market at this point, uh, but uh, I would say that it's, it's transitioning to more uh, favoring the seller, but it, I'm, I'm not going to particularly declare it being a sell, seller's market today. Okay, that's interesting that you mentioned that because out of a previous contract, the sort of, hit the market out of China, the, the, you know, the news that hit, hit the market uh, of that contract. Uh, it seemed to me like it's getting a, a good market for the producers, basically, because, yeah. um, and that's also something that we can talk about because they, they, they sort of announced that they, they, you know, the Chinese utility company signed a contract at like, call it $62, um, 40% of the contract was signed at $62 per pound uranium. And 60% of the contract was signed at spot. So that sort of nudged me in, in the direction of thinking that it might be a, a market that's improving for the producers. And, and I'm sort of the, the vibe that I'm getting from you is the same. But that was not in your contract. Like, you, you, you know, you're not, you, you didn't say how much is, is spot, how much is, is term and, and, and the prices, just because that's not how the game is played in the U.S., but could you maybe talk to me a little bit about why that is? Like, wh why why don't we share these type of things? Well, let's back up for a minute and talk about that Chinese contract. Sure. Remember, it's a it's a Chinese state owned utility doing business with a Chinese state owned mining company, mm -hmm. and so there's a difference in terms and, and everything else. Whereas in the Western portion, we're like what we work in the market we work in, uh, we're dealing with utilities that have different cost pressures. Uh, they're not state owned and, and some of them are not even regulated. Some are market uh, or merchant plants or merchant uh, utilities. And so they have different cost pressures. Some of them, you know, most of them have shareholders they have to respond to. And so uh, I'd say that uh, uh, the, the terms you have to work out of what they can accept, the management will accept. And, uh, uh, and within the constraints of either a public utilities commission or what their cost structure is. So our contract, we stated, was a market-related. So that means it's, there's no base escalator price or base price in there. Uh, and it's also got floors and ceilings on it. And uh, this, the floors are sufficient or more than sufficient to allow us to produce our uranium and make money on it. And the ceiling is, uh, is significantly higher than, than today's spot price. And uh, it gives me comfort level. Now, granted, if the price of uranium got to $100 a pound, we'd be leaving money on the table. But we also have another contract that we, public, we, really, we publicly released in, back in 2021 with UG, which is entirely on the spot market. So the bulk that we're going to be exposed to our contracting will have the ability to see higher prices and be able to accept pri higher prices, even though we've got these utility agreements. And one might ask, well, why don't you just do everything like you did the UG contract? Uh, there's, a, there's very specific reasons. One is we want to do business with utilities also. And our, uh, when, you're, when you're going and finding, you know, when we're doing, you know, we're not done with what we're doing on our, 
or production plans. We're starting in South Texas, but we, we've also acquired, as you recall, we acquired the Azarga properties with Dewey Burdock. We also picked up property in Wyoming Coast, Gas Hills. Those are going to require cap, capital. And uh, to be able to get the capital, you know, we want to look at the ability to do debt financing rather than doing uh, equity financing. So we don't uh, put our, our shareholders at risk with significant dilution. And uh, <clears throat> to do that, you need to have established effectively what I call double A type of uh, business entities, you know, that the credit secure and utilities have the fantastic credit security. And so by having contracts in place, we have, we have two things, we accomplish two things is that uh, I'm going to be able to sell uranium at prices more than I can, that I'm producing that cost I produce it at. So it's going to be profitable. And I'm going to have, be, have a business a relationship with a, a very solid entity uh, that uh, I can establish that uh, credit worthiness down the road when I need that credit. And that's important by having a, a, a willing buyer on the other side, a committed buyer on the other side. Uh, you know, the, uh, I've been in this business for a long time. Uh, and the last run up, I'm, you know, the, uh, uh, back in, from the period of 2006 to 2008, it was great times. Uh, we, you know, I, I, was, I was fortunate enough at that time to have an operation. I was delivering uranium into the market, principally into the spot market. And I had the fortune of negotiating a, a spot sale at $133 a pound. Uh, but that didn't last very long. Mm -hmm. And when the market collapsed and the hedge funds started exiting the market in 2008, uh, as a result of their margin calls, uh, in 2000, starting in 2009, I had to, I need, because we were living off the spot market, I had to go sell uranium and I was competing against those hedge funds, putting material in the market. And so it created a basically a dire work spiral of pricing as you were trying to, to liquidate, to get revenue. So by having a, a, uh, uh, established willing buyer, committed buyer on the other side, uh, we're also effectively protected from crowding the spot market and forcing, uh, you know, basically forcing a lower price. Uh, you know, you can see that example currently, you know, when Mark, you, know, you get willing uh, sellers that need to sell on the market, we see the price go down if there's no willing buyer at that point. Uh, when, like, for example, when spots out of the market and uh, the price gets driven down, whether through actual bids or actual supplier or uh, what we call uh, ghost uh, bids, uh, but they, they, it goes down because there's no willing buyers. Try doing that if you're trying to sell in the spot market. It gets really difficult to, to show that revenue. So by, not only by, by our UG contract, which, I, which was when we negotiated that, I was very happy with that one, but also with the utility contracts uh, being market related with ceilings and floors, that gives us some uh, assurance that we're gonna have a willing buyer at a known price. Uh, you know, the, if I'm selling at my ceiling uh, price that I'm at right, you know, with my contracts, I'm be thrilled. I think a shareholder is going to be thrilled if we're selling in that because it's like as if we established a, a base escalator pricing at, at uh, equivalent of base escalator pricing at today's, you know, relative today's uh, uh, spot market, spot price at a premium. So it's basically risk-free profit with benefit. And I obviously could appreciate that as a business owner myself. I wish I could do this type of agreements. Um, but uh, what I'm thinking, though, is that it you know you have the risk free. I, I understand where this is coming from, and I guess where sort of the counter argument might come in is is that okay, but this is possibly a different market, so we're expecting higher prices for longer. I mean. I guess experts out there that do these type of analyses are expecting higher prices for longer periods of time this time. So the counter argument would be, well, why not wait before you can sign contracts at a higher, you know, with a higher floor and a higher and a higher bottom, I guess, basically is that, so is that a valid counter argument? Oh, it's always, yeah, that's a valid counter argument. I, I, you know, I, I've, I've had that, I've had those that very specific same authentic conversation with management in my, in my prior lives. Uh, why, why, are we, why give up money and leave it on the table when we can see higher prices down, you know, in the near term? It's always a balancing act, right? 
Uh, so the way we mitigate that risk to the upside is by we don't go and commit to these type of, uh, uh, of agreements with ceilings, et cetera, that's going to be ex- in excess of our expected production. Half, you know, we're shooting for about no more than half, no more than half. And, and keep in mind for the next, uh, from 2023 to 2028, our UG contract is strictly on the spot market. So if the spot price gets to, you know, and again, that's forward-looking statements and then putting a lot of ifs and buts and everything else in this, is that say it gets to $100 a pound, we're going to be able to capture that with the bulk of our contract sales. It's not going to be limiting us. And, uh, and so uh, we'll be, our shareholders will be able to realize the upside of the market. Uh, but meanwhile, I'm securing uh, against any kind of, uh, you know, there's always a risk of what goes up comes back down. Mm-hmm. And by securing some base, you know, at least providing a base place for us to sell uranium prevents us from being completely subject to the whims of the spot market if we get in a situation where there's no support for the spot market. So you're just not, you're not getting greedy. You're doing this decently where you're open to the upside that we're all expecting. And then I guess you're mm-hmm. expecting as well. But then at the same time, you're making enough money that you, you're you going to cover your costs. So you're not going to put yourself out of business and you're going to have an acceptable right. return on, on, on capital employed. That, that's, yeah, that's right. That's the dream. I've been there when I had to, I had to make a cash call on a, on payments, you know, paid electricity bill and trying to, push uranium into a market that didn't need it in my past lives. And so that's, that's tough, but it's good to have a, a committed buyer on one side, even if it's not, you know, the perfect terms, it's uh, but it's uh, you, you, everything's a negotiation and, and you try to get to a point that works best for your business. I think what we're doing, our strategy is, is, is going to work very well for Encore. It's going to work very well for our shareholders. Do you think that other U.S. companies like sort of your counterparts, do you, do you think they're going to employ the same strategy or do you have a, just a speculation here, I guess, but, or do you expect them to go more aggressively on this? It's hard to say because everybody has their own strategy and they don't necessarily telegraph it. Uh, uh, I know there's some, uh, some of my, our competition that uh, talks about being completely hedged to the, or unhedged to the, or being tied directly to the spot market fully exposed the spot market. And that's one of their selling points. That's, that's, that's one strategy. And you get the other side, a good, good example is Cameco, which uh, is going to commit a hundred percent of their production to contracts. Uh, and uh, because that's their business model, it's always been, they don't play in the spot market except through their trading arm. And uh, uh, so the, uh, everybody has their own strategy. I think ours is a good solid strategy that provides that, uh, uh, it, it provides that uh, type assurance of return, and uh, but also assures that uh, we're we're not going to be running ourselves out of business because obviously, let's say for example, we have too much material, we got to sell it, and we have to sell it for below cost. And I believe with the strategy we've done is assuring that we make sure that we're covered on our cost side at least for a base level of product production. It, I I probably shouldn't speak out on these things because I just recently learned how to tie my own shoes. But this sounds to me like a higher quality strategy overall, where you have exposure to the upside, but you're protected to the downside. It, it's like exactly the type of strategy that you would expect from someone with more experience to the market who also wants to have at least some leverage to the upside. But do, do you think that the market realizes that value and, and is currently valuing you accordingly on a relative basis relative to the competitors that, that you're mentioning? I, well, first of all, I'm not an expert in the market. <laughs> There's a, you know, as far as uh, what I hear from our shareholders, both retail and, and institutional, is that they're, they're pretty happy with the strategy we've taken. Uh, I'm not going to say, I, I can't say whether one strategy is better than the other, but this is the one that I believe has, will work the best, particularly when we've got market conditions that uh, are literally changing by the week. And uh, I think it gives us the best opportunity uh, going forward, and it really fits our business, pro- our business model. Okay, yeah. Well, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, talking about that business model, by the way, and also talking about your counterparts. And well, I guess it, it makes sense here in a second why I'm adding this to the, the this question to the conversation here. But some of your 
competitors to call them have been um, picking up other publicly listed companies as 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 of you with Azarga, and uh, one of them very recently. I don't know if it's polite to bring him bring up the exact name. You know what I'm talking about. If you want to talk about it, you can name the name in other ways. But I guess people know what it is. But so, will do, do you think you'll be trying to catch up with them in terms of M and A on other public companies? Because I know that again, you picked up. Azarga, but they have also been picking up a lot of land in the US last year. But in terms of like a full company acquisition, is that something that fits your strategy going forward? Or is that too forward looking to talk about? Well, just to kind of build a little bit of uh, context to our, my, my answer to that is, is that, first of all, we're always looking at opportunities where we can strengthen and increase the, uh, the, 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 um, the strength of our company. Uh, we still believe there's more room for consolidation. Mm-hmm. Uh, the uh, but our strategy is focused at this moment in the U.S. Uh, and when you look at the public companies or that are that are in the U.S. that have, uh, let's say, to, to qualify them, uh, near-term production, real near-term production, not just uh, 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 talked about. Uh, and we know who those companies are. Those assets. It's. The, the, the pool suddenly has gotten very, very small, if you understand what I mean. And uh, not all those, uh, uh, all those opportunities uh, are, are make bus- you know, will, make, will be ones that uh, make business sense. I'd say that uh, I wouldn't rule out any of them, rule it out, but uh, it's, it just creates an error. We're looking at other, we're looking at lots of opportunities to leverage uh, on the M&A side. Uh, but, uh, you know, you know, until, you know, we, at this point, we haven't found something outside the U.S. that, uh, that uh, intrigues us. And I know that's where a lot of the opportunities lie is outside the U.S. Uh, but you know, obviously our, our, our expertise and uh, the principal resources we have sit within the boundaries of the United States. And so that's where we're focusing. And yes, it does kind of limit us on some some opportunities for M and A, uh, but I don't think I'm not going to rule out that it keeps us from doing M and A's. There's lots of opportunities that may not involve that could be significantly accretive to uh, our company that may not directly involve just strictly an you know merger with another public traded company. Mm. Okay, fair enough. Please feel free to tell me off if I'm, I'm I'm going in places where I'm not supposed to be going. But but just sort of to go a little bit more in depth on that. Uh, M and A strategy of yours. Do you think you're, you'll be looking specifically for ISR type deposits, or would would other deposits also be of interest? Uh, we're going to focus on ISR, and and there's there's a there's a primary reason why is that uh, to 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 go after conventional opportunities. Uh, it it narrows down the the, the pathway. Uh, one would have to build a, a uranium mill because there's limited uh, milling capacity in the United mm-hmm. States, and uh, and there's a, a significant capital cost associated with that. Am I going to rule it out? No, but uh, at this point in time, within Encore's uh, current portfolio and our our operating strategy, uh, we don't see a good fit for conventional properties. Um, again, I'll never say no, but it's got to be under the right circumstances. Mm. Uh, we have several conventional properties we have right now. Uh, we, we announced that we sold off one of them, Sovieta, to a company called Future Fuels Inc. Uh, and uh, we may be doing, you may, there's a possibility you could be seeing more news to that tune uh, in the future. Okay. Well, I'll be on the lookout for that. You're mentioning your, your operational strategy as well. What what is the sort of the, the the business plans or the strategy around the processing plans that that you have going on? Could you rephrase that question? Or when uh, you say per- well, I'm just thinking how I'm more interested in learning more about the processing plan to begin with, and I think that if you, if you talk oh, about your processing, processing plan, plan, you're gonna you, you, yeah. it's eventually gonna come down to sort of the the, the the strategy behind it and what you plan on doing with it. Right. So we, uh, yeah, I'll get started with that one. And uh, the, um, the processing plan is, you know, we have cur- currently two licensed facilities that actually mm-hmm. operate under the same license. That's Kingsville, Dome and Rosita. Uh, 
so our focus immediately is to leverage leverage those two assets in Texas. Uh, so you see what we're doing right now. We're advancing a, a uh, what we call Rosita Extension. It's a well field we're putting in right now to get us started in 2023. We have Rosita South, which is a, 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 a development project beyond Rosita Extension. Uh, and uh, But also we have a property we're developing right now called Upper Spring Creek, which is about 50 miles away. So what we're trying to do is load up Rosita with production, uh, uh, load its capacity up, and then uh, we're going to make a, a, a decision based on trade-off studies on whether we expand capacity at Rosita or we shift a portion of that demand to Kingsville Dome and use, utilize Kingsville Dome rather than spending the capital. Everything's going to depend on, obviously, the availability of capital, uh, the, the current cost, you know, what the availability of equipment is to expand. But we have that ability to, right now, Kingsville with a small investment you know, about a million, million and a half bucks, we can get Kingsville back up uh, to be an operating central processing plant. And we can be sending material to Ros Kingsville as well, parallel with Rosita. So we don't have, we're not focused strictly on Rosita. Rosita is the low hanging fruit. That's where we're starting. Kingsville is the production option, but we still have the ability to expand capacity at both locations for uh, right now in today's dollars, uh, probably for less than $2 million to, to more than double production at each site, mm. you know, basically push each one to, to 2 million pounds a year. Uh, if we chose to, it's just a matter of where it makes sense on deploying that capital, our production stream and everything else. Uh, we are also securing additional properties to expand that, uh, the, the reach of our, our, uh, you know, our satellite facilities to uh, bring more feed in. Okay. That gives me more clarity on it. I think as one of the the main selling points of Encore was that you're a low low price future producer, basically. Yeah. And um, last time we spoke again, I think it was July last year. Inflation wasn't running as hot, and That's now great. we're seeing very high readings across the board. But um, that, that I guess you you told me that you can produce profitably at like under forty dollars a pound. So based on what you just told me, is that uh, based on what you just told me in combination with inflation, is that still the case or are you going to see your cost increase as well? Well, we've seen cost increase, but, you know, I, when I provide those numbers, it's always with a caveat that this is based on you know, prior experience and estimates. Hmm. Right now, we're actually seeing the real cost and I'm still confident we can still produce well under $40 a pound all in. That includes covering reclamation costs and everything else. So uh, all in, we're, we're still, some, you know, under under forty dollars a pound. So I feel very good about that. Uh, we have seen costs like raw materials, like casing, has gone up as doubled in price. Uh, but we're blessed by the fact that we have very sh shallow deposits we're going after. So we're not using as much casing as say at some of the other sites that you might see up in Wyoming. Mm. Uh, and uh, and drilling costs are are higher than what we paid say 15 years ago, but they're not out of range. When I quoted you that price a year ago, uh, that cost estimate, that was based on assuming there's gonna be some higher costs, but uh, the, the, I think the biggest challenge we've had, uh, I'll say that, that, that impacts us is really the supply chain. Uh, I kind of built in cost increases when I gave you that number. So like I said, I feel very, you know, right now, based on what we're seeing today, we're, I still feel, feel very comfortable with that number I gave you a year ago. Uh, the, but what we're seeing is, is that uh, there's sometimes we have critical equipment that's caught in a container off the port of Los Angeles type of thing. You know, it, sometimes I feel like that old uh, saying, you know, for want of a nail, a kingdom fell type of thing, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, bit, I'm probably exaggerating a bit, but, uh, you know, uh, that's the thing that, that keeps me awake at night. I about uh, in fact, uh, last um, uh, November, I spoke at the uh, NEI uh, meeting in Savannah, Georgia, and one of the questions after we presented, I presented with Cameco and with uh, Kaz Adam Prom, and someone asked me what keeps you awake at night, and I said, believe it or not, PVC casing, and everybody was looking at me like I was some kind of Martian or something like that. And I asked why. I said, because PVC casing is tied to, I'm competing with 
governments that are building out sewage plants and everything else are using the same material I'm using. In addition to, we have high gas prices, which means the raw feedstock to create PVC is less available because most of it's going into energy production. So you create a situation where we have a, uh, you know, I was dealing with lead times of 12 to 16 weeks to get loads of casing out. And actually what I had to do was, uh, if you follow our news, uh, we did a, a bought deal financing back at late March. I took some of those proceeds and basically invested and bought all the casing I need for the first well field, all of it at once, rather than depending on just-in-time inventory. So when we're starting to case the well field, now it's starting to show up now because I bought an entire product. I brought an entire production line and got that committed to me by doing that. Those are the type of things we're having to, we're having to change the way we think uh, and do it when we're planning out our business. We're, we're now doing everything one year in advance rather than doing two months in advance mm. uh, type of thing. And uh, so we're always looking at those challenges. So that would, that's where I see the biggest change since uh, we last talked. I didn't expect inflation to get to the point where it is now, uh, but uh, it, I, I think that we're okay within our estimates based on what we're doing. We already had factored in enough. I would say that all my cushion I had in that number probably was consumed quite a bit, but uh, we're still okay. And uh, I still feel that that number I quoted you a year ago, it still remains good and strong. And, uh, and, and uh, outside of that, my main issue is, you know, I've got I hired a new COO uh, whose experience has worked for me in the past. Uh, he's picking up all this stuff and making sure that everything's happening on the right schedule and getting things in early enough so we're not held up. Do you think that any other company can say the same thing in the U? Let's call it in, 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 in the Western part of the world, basically, where they are going to be making money at $40. Is, it, is there somebody that can do it? Well, you know, it, it's it's hard to say these days. And, and the reason why I say it, I hate to caveat it, is that all this stuff. But um, uh, frankly, I haven't gone and looked at what my competition can do because I've been so focused on making sure we're doing what we say we're going to do and also keeping our costs low. Uh, the uh, But the... Uh, uh, you know, we already see cost pressures hitting even our the cheapest production in the world, which is Kazakhstan, uh, is being hit by cost increases uh, and uh, other costs. So I, I see that uh, uh, as far as number of the probably number of sub forty production is is still there. Uh, uh, that but uh, everybody's margins are getting squeezed. So all of us, our costs are getting closer to that forty dollar per pound. Uh, number, but uh, I would say that there's still, there's not a big pool of people out there that can do that. Uh, uh, and I'm doing my damnedest to make sure we're one of those that can. I think it's going to be an interesting situation to watch. I uh, spoke to Je- Jeff Clinton out of your energy also a yeah. while back. I got to get him on again. Their costs were relatively high as well. And they can, so there's not many people they can deliver into such a tight market at such a good price. So that's going to be interesting to watch. Yeah. And, you know, I've got a lot of respect for Jeff and I, I really have a lot of respect for the work he's done with UR Energy. Mm. Uh, and, uh, you know, I know he's uh, stepped back and I wish him the best, but I think they've, you know, they've got a good project. They've got good cost return, but everybody's feeling the same pressure. Our advantage, where we have an advantage over, say, the Wyoming operations that were much, much closer to where the raw feedstock is in the manufacturing. Uh, a lot of the, you know, Houston's only a three hour drive from us. That's where most of the feedstock is. And uh, labor, we haven't had the labor cost increase that they show up that Wyoming has seen. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we have, you know, I'm going to say it's going to stay fixed, but at the moment, uh, even our fuel prices are lower uh, simply because of the refining capacity it's down here. And, uh, and as a result, so diesel is probably, 25% lower than it is in Wyoming right now. Right, 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 right. Yeah, it's good, it's good to know these things. Good, good to talk about these things as well in, in, in more natural discussion because, you know, oftentimes these 
conversations would be Q&A based and I'd be like, okay, what's your prediction cost? Okay, that's that. But then you don't hear many people talking about, okay, I'm having a, a PVC piping, you know, concern, maybe not a direct issue, but a concern and like diesel, you know, it, it's like 25% cheaper. Or it, it, it's a bit more expensive over there. Like not many people are discussing the actual cost. And I, I don't think it's, I don't think they're that easy to understand either. Like it, it seems to me, uh, you know, a gold mining open pit operation is seems a lot more straightforward than what, you know, than what uranium companies have going on. Is that, is that the case? Yeah. And the reason why it's much more straightforward is that uh, uh, who's been operating in the last 10 years and then mm-hmm. the uranium space, it's mostly been overseas, not in the U S so we're not seeing a real, we don't have a constant picture of what the cost is in U.S. dollars, which, which is what we spend most of our time talking about relative to a commodity that's priced in U.S. dollars. Whereas the gold side, you've got those mines been operating continuously or, or new ones starting, et cetera. Uh, it's a lot more transparent because the, the numbers are current. Uh, when you look at that relative to the commodity price, uraniums, because of the fact it's so cyclical and, and Unfortunately, our cycles are such that sometimes the downside is far deeper and far longer than our upsides are. And so it doesn't give you a good uh, apples to or apples to apples comparison when you try to look at impacts of cost and everything else. So everything we're, you know, honestly, uh, the last time I put in, I, I managed an operation where we put in new wealth fields, that was 2015 uh, and uh, 16. And the world's changed dramatically since then, as far as I'm being probably a little bit uh, hyperbolic there, but uh, uh, the world, at least the market, the the availability of drilling rigs, the cost of drilling, the fuel cost, uh, materials cost, but, you know, even supply, you know, even back then as, you know, we could call up our our vendors and say, I need need 16 lifts of casing and I need 50 pumps and they would be there within three to four weeks. It's a different story now. You know, everything's changed dramatically. And, but we haven't had that, that run for the last five to seven years to be able to get a good picture of what things look like in today's snapshot. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think we're starting to get there. I'm, I'm, you know, although I, you know, the, the cost increase we're seeing around are in very specific commodities and very sm- specific areas. Uh, and, uh, but, Overall, I still have a high level of comfort of understanding what our, our cost risks are. And, uh, and that's one of the things that uh, I've been focused, you know, that's why I brought in a good experienced team uh, I, that, to be it, who, who've been down this road plenty of times and, and, uh, and we're able to leverage that to, to give us a little bit better planning, uh, uh, better execution and everything else. And, you know, is it, flaw- is it uh, flawless and perfect? I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it is, but I feel like we've mitigated a lot of those cost risk and supply chain risk that others may uh, not be expecting. Mm. Well, that's good to know. It's good to know that you're uh, sort of expecting positive free cash flow and profitability here despite, uh, despite ramping inflation. But I guess that, I guess that cash flow is not, you know, it's not coming in right away. And that might be a good segue into talking a little bit more about Encore's financial situation. Uh, like, do, do you need that you think that, that, that you, you'll need to have to hit the market for capital before you get into production or maybe before you potentially get a, a NASDAQ listing, which was a, a thing a couple of months ago that you were discussing? Because you, you, you closed last year with what about, I've got it written down on here, about $11.5 million dollars. So how's your cash and debt situation right now? And do you think you're going to have to hit the market for cash soon? So the, the, our cash position is very sound. We did a block deal financing back at the end of March and, you know, mm-hmm. we received some criticism over it, but now we're all, everybody looks at us as being geniuses uh, because of where the equities are now compared mm-hmm. to where they were back at the mm-hmm. end of March. Uh, the, uh, but that gave us more that we oversubscribed that. And that gave us $30 million Canadian and we're we're sitting on right now with what we already had in the uh, the bank at around twenty six million dollars U S in the in the in the, in the treasury, uh, mm-hmm. and uh, we have uh, that gives us sufficient cash to execute our production plans for twenty twenty three and get into production 
with the expectation of cash flowing before we may or may not need any further capital infusion. Now, that's not to say that if there's an opportunity that comes up where we might need to might make look at an accretive uh, acquisition or something uh, that could change things. But uh, right now for our current production plans at the moment and everything we anticipate we're going to need to get there, uh, we have more than sufficient cash to get us into production. Mm. Okay. Okay. And now you're talking about, as you said, things that you, you, you can sort you had sort of foreseen. Um, I believe that in, in, in 2021, you also had purchased like something like 300,000 pounds of uranium and uh, it does some calculations. It looks like you paid under 40 per pound for them. Um, but then you also had you sold some, well, actually you sold most of it. I believe 200,000 of it you sold. So I'll, are you allowed to tell me how much of that you still have and whether maybe it's pushed think, or, yeah. Well, we've disclosed all that. So it's all been in our, in our financials, the sell price and everything else. And hmm. uh, Don't get me quoting on it because I don't have the numbers in front of me. But we sold at 300,000 pounds. Uh, what we've done was just, we've actually, you know, we, we made a profit on all of it. Right. Uh, did we hit the top of the market? No, we didn't. But the timing is everything, right? You can't always predict the tops and you can't predict the bottoms. And uh, we did, you know, we, we feel good about the revenue we generated off. It was timely. It was, it was sooner than we expected we would need it. Uh, but it uh, provided us an opportunity to, uh, uh, you know, this was all before we got did our bought deal financing. We weren't expecting to do a financing right away in March. Uh, and so it gave us the cash to get carry us through the end of 2023 by doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, since that time, uh, we've all, we've secured an option, uh, to purchase 200,000 pounds in 2023, uh, with a prepayment at a price, the price total price be below significantly below today's stop, spot price. But I feel pretty good about that. That I can't disclose until we actually do it. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, uh, you know, we have disclosed, we have the option in place. Uh, for the 200,000 pounds, we have not disclosed the, I don't believe we disclosed the, uh, the, the total transaction. I have to go back and look at my financials to, to, to provide some confidence on that. No, that's pl pl plenty, plenty good of an answer. I think I was mostly looking to sort of figure out how, how, how you plan on targeting that market. Like, are you going to be doing any of it? And then, well, you, you gave me a sufficient answer there. Um, sure. What about what about your sort of GNA and, and your management pay and you know other related expenses? I guess those have gone up. They now have. That the workload has gone up, and uh, they've gone up. Uh, obviously, we've had to staff up. Uh, going going from being basically a property holding company to being an actual near term producer, we've had to staff up. So, I brought in geologic mm -hmm. staff. I've got administrative and financial staff that. Uh, and then obviously with the, the acquisition of Azarga, uh, that added additional properties and other things. And we brought in, a, you know, there was a workforce that came with that as well that added to our overhead. Uh, I, we still try to run a lean shop and I, I, I don't have the numbers in front of me. I'm, I'm sorry to say that, but uh, I, I would say that uh, uh, we're probably running, gosh, I don't want to lie. Um, it's probably running three times higher than what we were doing last year. Three times. Okay. Yeah. I, I could be wrong. It may be two times, but I have to go back and look at the numbers. Hmm. Uh, and I'm sorry. I, I wasn't prepared to answer that question. I should have known that would be on a question list, but I just forgot to, to go back and. Uh, no worries. No, that's not what I mean. Specific numbers. Everybody can look it up. As I said, they can yeah. look up your, your senior documents. I can give some numbers. What you did last year, you did four and a half million in, GNA and it was about three and a half million, uh, including stock, including stock options yeah. that you did on on staff cost. So that's what you did last year. Uh, you know the financials are out there. What I was looking for was more of an answer of okay, you know you're increasing your staff. How's that affecting your bottom line? How, how's that affecting? No, obviously your bottom line. We shouldn't talk about that. But how's that affecting your operational uh, security and stuff like that? But you also have a big cash position, so. Yeah, so just just to, to cover that point, so that's you know, so that can be more uh, whole on answering your question. Uh, we anticipate these costs, you know, adding staff and et cetera, uh, uh, 
when we started, like when we started our budgeting last year, we knew we were going to have to add these additional costs uh, because we have to execute on our plan. And uh, uh, frankly, the, uh, the, you know, I just didn't have the capacity to be able to do it myself. I would love to do it all myself, but as you know, I'm not getting any younger. And uh, so uh, uh, bringing in the additional staff was anticipated. We knew our, our overhead costs were going to go up. Uh, we did by creating, you know, putting in a corporate office, we had uh, additional costs. Fortunately, I got a great deal on the office space, uh, uh, far less than uh, what we could have gotten anywhere else in town. And, uh, uh, and so I feel pretty good about that, that we're doing our best to minimize our GNA cost uh, rather than, you know, creating, you know, I don't want to be seen, I don't want Encore to be seen as a lifestyle company. I want to see us be as a real producer and a real production company. That means making sure that all our GNA is going directly to advancing the operational plan, not just expanding scope of the. Uh, uh, I'm on i I'm on an interview. Sorry, my no assistant worries. came in. <laughs> she didn't know I was on an interview. No worries, uh, but, I can. Uh, you know, we. I'm trying. You know, we got a lot of people. We, we don't have a big staff here. I got six people in the corporate office. Bulk of our people are out in the field. And almost everybody in the corporate office supports directly what's going on out in the field. So, I mean, you're going to have to do a lot of effort to be seen as a lifestyle company, I think. Uh, there's clear differences there. So, uh, yeah. Well, let's hope that the market is also with you on this one. And uh, I watched an interview with Bill Sheriff a couple of... Um, maybe a week a month ago a couple of weeks ago I mean, something like that anyways and he he said that you know he said that old, old thing that people say like when when the market gives you money to get into production you better take that money right. and so let's hope that the market is with you while you're delivering on those goals and yeah um, I, yeah i think overall our our market you know the uranium space is being you know the equity price and everything is not being impacted by the fact that our narrative or, or the, the, uh, the stories change, it's been more of the overall markets and that's what's driven, you know, driven them that, uh, the, the equity prices down. I think we'll see support. Uh, and I think we'll be, you know, once things stabilize and people figure out what, where the opportunities are, I think we'll start seeing improving, uh, support mm. for our, our business. Right. Well, the last time we spoke, I'm referencing to it a lot because I'm, I'm sort of remembering these things, but you told me that you expect the, the market to get going by 2023 because that's, that was when you were expecting utilities to start contracting more heavily. Um, and you also aim to be operate, that, that was the reason that you, aim to, uh, that you aim to be operational by 2023. Do, do you still think that'll be the case like do you still think that the market is going to get moving in 2023 or do you think we'll see more contracting sooner because of what's been happening on geopolitical level i think we'll see more contracting happening sooner uh i still see the demand in 2023 i think most of demand the, the actual demand for deliveries of uranium have been pretty much filled for 2023 uh, based on my conversations with nuclear utilities uh, which is constant, uh, that the, now we're moving the calendar out to 2024, 2025, but they still have to come in. You know, now the, the, what you see them coming in doing is having conversations about securing 2024, 25 and beyond and 2022 uh, so they can get better prices, better terms at this point. Uh, and that's, that's a good strategy for them. The other thing that's impacting a lot of contracting at the moment is uh, with Russia effectively out of the picture going forward uh, that, uh, you know, we're going to see a bifurcated market where the, there's going to be a Western uh, market and then a uh, Russia Eastern market type of thing uh, that uh, we're seeing the, the utilities are trying to figure out the puzzle of how they're going to get enrichment and conversion. So I think there's been kind of a pause in some of the contracting while they try to solve that riddle. And it's not something that happens to them. They can't do overnight, which is why you see swoop prices and conversion prices jumping up dramatically uh, as, as companies that were caught effectively with, uh, uh, by surprise with what, what's going on in Russia, Russia and Ukraine 
uh, they've gone and tried to scoop up as much as they can. And that's created this, this uh, rush to the market for conversion and, and SWU. Once there's some certainty with respect to enrichment and particularly conversion, because that's the key point right now. That's where the, the critical path on the nuclear fuel cycle is because the enrichers can meet the enrichment demand by overfeeding. Mm -hmm. By getting the uranium, the UF6, uranium hexafluoride, to the enricher is where the challenge is. And that's going to require more conversion and more uranium. And so the utilities are trying to figure out those questions. And so they're, the, that, that, uh, question, those series of questions and supply points, and then they'll know how much uranium they actually have to contract for what's going to be the tails assays and everything else. And at that point, once they know how much conversion capacity they have, they can know how much uranium they have to contract for. So it's kind of created kind of a, a slump in some of the expected contracting uh, that we were expecting to see, you know, as, as recently as January of this year, uh, it's kind of pushed a lot of that out. And uh, until they fix those, address those two points of contact, uh, it's going to it's going to slow down the uranium contracting, but I think overall we'll get better terms once they solve those uh, points. Is that is that short term solvable? Or do you think that the situation is going to remain like that for a while? It's short. I think it's going to be a, a four to five year uh, situation, and then after that it'll solve itself. Markets will have a ten markets have a tendency to fix themselves. I want to talk about, you know, the fuel cycle will solve itself. Either commercially they're going to increase uh, enrichment capacity at the western side or governments are going to get involved. As you've seen with the, uh, the, the, the recent news out of Bloomberg about a $4.3 billion U.S. government purchasing plan for low enriched and HALU and high assay low enriched uranium. Uh, and so uh, that's to, to provide the government as a, premium buyer for those services so they'll, they'll uh, drive investment into enrichment and conversion because uh, the utilities aren't doing that yet, but the government's willing to step up to the plate and do it. And uh, that will, that's when it's going to take that long for the ripple effect. In other words, to get the capacity installed and the enrichment side to be able to make up for the gap on the Russian supply, but also to assure that there's sufficient conversion capacity to meet that demand. Because uh, right now they can meet it by increasing tails assays, but that's not, nobody likes that because higher tails assays are just not nearly as efficient as, uh, as a way they've been operating the enrichment plants. Uh, and it's very costly. It's very costly to do it that way. So by, by, uh, Getting in, by investing in additional uh, enrichment capacity and conversion capacity, they'll drive those costs down and make the price of uranium less of a factor in the decisions. So where does that, what does that result in for the price of uranium? Because at first for those four to five years, as you said, they're probably going to have to be overfeeding. That overfeeding causes an, an actual additional demand that we weren't expecting before this. Mm -hmm. So that's bullish for the price, but where does that bring us in the four to five years after that? I think we'll start now. I'm just spec, you know, at this point, it's all speculation. I right. couldn't, you know, if I could told you what was happening last this week, last week, I probably would have been, I should have, uh, I could have been betting on more things. But uh, uh, my expectation is we'll see more of an equilibrium once the, the, all the services get in point and the market starts to, to, to uh, stabilize overall as a result of the change in the, the, the structure, the fundamental structure of the market, which is that bifurcation I talked about. Uh, but also we'll have a better, you know, the one thing that we don't want is have nuclear power plants shut down because there goes our customer base. So the expectation is we'll have continuous uh, con customers uh, out there and it'll be, an, it'll be a concept at that point, how much more nuclear power is going to be built? How much are we going to execute on? You know, we hear news about new reactors being built in, in the Netherlands, uh, reactors being built in the UK, small modular reactors. I think in that five-year period, we'll get a better idea of what that new demand is going to look like. And that could create additional. If that demand really shows up, and I, there's no reason to doubt it won't, uh, that... Um, or doubt it will, I should get my phrases right, grammar right. 
uh, that um, the uh, uh, if that shows up, then we're going to have increased demand, and that's going to be good for the. It's going to be bullish for the price in the long term. Uh, if it's status quo, the price is going to be significantly higher than they're going to have to be higher than where they're at now because. I would expect the cost of production to go up also over that period of time. So we're going to see overall, you know, inflation is going to drive everything up. And, uh, but also we're going to have that demand maybe equalized, but it's going to be equalized at levels that are going to be much better for the uranium industry. Uh, and assuming that uh, everything stays status quo, which right now at five years out, I would not bet that's going to be the case. But all the tea leaves read towards higher demand, which is going to provide more upside for uranium price. Hmm. And that's over a longer period of time than we were originally expecting. Yeah. So. Yeah. And uh, it, it just seems like everything right now, the momentum's back towards nuclear. Uh, security of supply is a, a discussion point that uh, we haven't heard from the nuclear utilities. And the last 10 years, all of a sudden, it's become part of their day-to-day uh, discussion points. And, uh, and so I see that being favorable not only for the overall uranium market, but also uh, as a, my bias is, as being a U.S. domestic producer, is a, an opportunity for us to be solving that security of supply problem or concern. If you were a, a, a retail investor in this market right now, is that also how you'd approach the market? Like from a you know U.S. based standpoint, uh, or would you be diversifying more? Is that something you feel comfortable talking about? Yeah, well, you know, from a personal basis, I I, uh, I have mostly U.S. focus on my my side, but that's me because I've I've worked in that space mm. most of the time, but. You know, a normal retail investor is just going to have to, like you, you know, they're going to have to do their own due diligence to look at their risk, uh, 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 their risk of tolerance, and also decide where they, you know, where they think that the best rate of re- return is going to be. Well, I, I happen to think that the, the best upside, you know, from my only from my opinion and viewpoint, is I see that the biggest upside is going to be in the United States. And that's simply because we have a, you know, the, 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 the country risk is low. I know we have a more, more difficult regulatory process, but I believe that the, the people who operate here understand that very well. And, uh, and we can make that, uh, it's all part of our business plan. And uh, it provides a, a secure place to do operations. Uh, the, uh, the other way it goes is that uh, if uh, we, we, uh, you know, one could look at the overall. Canada is a good investment. Uh, with respect to the Athabasca, there's a lot of potential upside there. Mm. Uh, and uh, you know, but where else do you go? Australia. You know that that's that's always a you know Australia is a great opportunity. Uh, but the risk there is that uh, you run into regulatory issues with respect to where you can mine and where you can't uh, in the different states. And so. Uh, everybody has to do their own research and decide where they where they think that it's best to put their money. And uh, I certainly can't advise on that. No, obviously not, of course. But it's uh, it sounds to me like you're like you're not bullish on the U.S. for reasons related to like the four point three million dollar announcement that we had, or something related to like Section two three two. That was a thing when I was getting into uranium for the first time. So is that something that you, you think about or bring into your thesis? Well, just, you know, for all, you know, for full transparency, I was heavily involved in the 232 under my, mm. with my prior employer. So I was there from the day we filed the petition to the day that, uh, right. you know, that the decision was made uh, to uh, the action to take was going to be performed the nuclear fuel working group. So I was heavily involved with all that. And so I, I think that uh, uh, the one thing I, I got to say about that whole process is that, uh, is that everything we prognosticated that could have happened has, ha- has transpired since 2019. I just didn't expect the bulk of that, uh, uh, that prediction to occur in the first quarter of 2022. Mm. And, uh, you know, there, there's, you know, the, we, we always talked about the risk of Kazakhstan supply, the 
you know, the government uh, could easily change hands. You know, we had a near miss with respect to attempted coup. Uh, the, the fact that the transportation routes all run through Russia rather than having al- alternate routes. Uh, the the uh, other one is risk that uh, Russia could invade in, in Ukraine. And I was like, I, I think I mentioned earlier, we were just assured that that would never happen because uh, the, the Russian government needed a, a U.S. dollars too, too strongly. And mm. uh, we found that that's not necessarily the case. Um, the, uh, but I think it, it, the work we did showed that if you go back, if one goes to the Commerce Department and looks for that report that they did, even though it's redacted, it shows a definitive discussion about uh, the risk to the U.S. industry, the nuclear, you know, and the national security risk, but also talks about some of the biggest risks are people, uh, you know, lack of people and uh, uh, et cetera. And also, uh, you know, just getting everything back up and running. And, and I think that if I had to, to guess, I would say that the, the DOE's uh, nuclear fuel plan that they're, that $4.3 billion are planning to spend seems reads just like the blueprint that was put out by the nuclear fuel working group uh, back in 20 early or uh, uh, early 2021 or early 2020. Yep. 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 I'm going to, I have got a hard stop at, uh, at the bottom of the hour. Okay. Yeah. Well then, I'm going to have to let you go. I can sit here and talk for, for, for hours with you because it's really wonderful sort of picking your brain on, because you have a lot of information. But thank you for being here. Uh, and I hope we can do this again soon. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thanks for your time and thanks for the opportunity.